four, three, two, one. Ignition sequence has started. Liftoff, we have liftoff. Go, 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 Okay, yes, sir, we've had a problem here. Say again, please. Oh, here, we've had a problem. That's been a long way, but we're here. Okay, are you guys ready? Here we go. It might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning it safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. None will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. when I was selected for the program, I had very high aspirations of flying a lunar landing, but Apollo at that time when Germany was going on, although it was in existence and in work, uh, for those of us who were very deeply involved in Germany, it was still quite a step away. I used to give a talk now and then to different groups throughout the country and uh, talked about someday we're gonna walk on the surface of the moon. Not just go there, but walk on the surface of the moon. And uh, I believed it, even though I found it hard to believe myself. I did believe it because I believed in what I was doing. But I turned around one day and I found out, gee, I was one of those guys who was walking in space. And uh, with a little luck and God willing, I'll be one of those guys who's gonna walk on the surface of the moon. And even having done some of this, it's still almost unrealistic to me. In spite of the fact that I've had a chance to fly a couple times, I've been close to the moon, I haven't made that moon landing, and believe me, it's no easier today than they were in the past, and certainly they're not for a crew who's never made that lunar landing before. I think, just like everybody else has flown, I and people who fly with me and after me will bring very special experience to the program. Experience gathered generally prior to becoming an astronaut and then added to while they have been an astronaut. My experience just happens to be in the field of geology and in particular in the observation of materials of the earth as they exist in the field. Uh, that's what basically a field geologist does. 
in the case of exploring the far frontiers of space, a geologist has an advantage because that's his livelihood and that's what he's been doing most of his life. I don't feel that unusual. A lot of people think of it as being unusual, but it's really just another specialty. Hopefully, uh, we open up with this the possibilities of applying other specialists to other problems. Apollo 17 is what we call a J mission series, or it's a follow-on to Apollo 15 and 16, where we really sort of change the capability of the spacecraft. We have more payload on this flight. As a result, we have uh, quite an extensive and heavier scientific package in our spacecraft, which, of course, means uh, it takes longer time to, uh, to deploy it, to set it up, to get it working. With that in mind, and to spend additional time on exploring the uh, geological finds we hope uh, will be in Taurus Littra, our landing site. We hope to spend a little bit longer time on the lunar surface. We added a lunar rover to the lunar module so that we could go further distances from the lunar module after we landed, uh, uh, get into areas uh, in terms of geological exploration and exploration of the moon that we couldn't get to before. We've been training for about 12 months, maybe slightly longer than that. It's hard to remember once you get involved in this thing how long you've been working on it. But of course, the training for any uh, spaceflight mission begins several years before that. And for me, I guess the concentrated training for spaceflight began with Apollo 15 in the uh, December of 1969. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, we're at T-minus one hour, 22 minutes, and counting. Out at the pad, the space vehicle is surrounded by searchlights producing some 225 foot candles of light. At liftoff, approximately 7,500 foot candles will be produced from the flame of the Saturn V engines. This is almost equivalent to daylight. Our countdown continuing to go smoothly now as we approach the one hour mark. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Some people think that uh, because Apollo 17 is the final Apollo lunar landing, that it should be a spectacular of some kind, so someone decided that it would be a night launch. Well, it is a night launch, but it was not planned that way. It really came out by accident. The fact that you pick a landing site, and our landing site is in a relatively remote area of the moon in the northeast corner, the uh, launch time of day is really dictated to us. Nevertheless, that night launch is going to be very, very exciting, as much so for the people who are watching it as the three of us who have the opportunity to fly it. This launch will be aiming Apollo 17 for the Taurus Littro area of the moon, named after the Taurus Mountains in southern Turkey and the Austrian astronomer Littro. The site is expected to yield some of the oldest and some of the youngest lunar samples returned during the Apollo flight to the moon. chance to complete this first phase of lunar exploration. In the last chapters of a lunar history book that Apollo has the capability of writing. We won't know it for 50, 100 years, but some of the things that we are finding that were completely unexpected, that we didn't plan to find, will almost certainly be the most important things in the eyes of the history of science and very probably in the eyes of the history of man. This is Apollo Saturn launch control, first stage, second stage, third stage, now all going to internal power. The flight of Apollo 17 will be able to be seen some 500 miles away as it goes into Earth orbit. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon, and to the planets beyond. And this generation does not intend 
the founder and the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. Entering the final phases of the countdown, various elements of the team reporting into with their go, no goes for launch. First stage reporting, they are go. Range safety, they are go. Launch director Walter Caprian has given a go for launch. Apollo 17, the launch team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Let me just go. Vanguard. 25 General. seconds and counting, we are still go. There we go. 20 seconds, guidance alert. The guidance system now going internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. G-forces of about 4 Gs uh, at shutdown. Stand by for mode 1, Charlie 17. Coming up on first stage shutdown. <laughs> 17, Houston, you are go for orbit. Go for orbit. Those are kind words, Robert. We're go for orbit here. Good show, babe. A little late, but a good show. Not standing right. Sure felt like it. Uh, we've confirmed Apollo 17 is in a near nominal orbit. The uh, translunar injection burn is targeted to uh, last five minutes, 51 seconds, accelerating Apollo 17 to the uh, required speed to get it into an orbit that'll intercept the moon. Looking great on a final status check here, and you're go for TLI. Seventeen Houston, you're looking good, and the thrust is go. Booster reports the thrust looks good on the S4B. The velocity increasing, uh, up now to 26,000 feet per second, beginning to climb ever more rapidly. This burn was initiated at an altitude of about 97 nautical miles above Earth. Uh, when finished, the spacecraft will be at about 150 miles above Earth and on its way to the moon, some 213,000 nautical miles away. Look at that. Damn, 
Madagascar in Africa. Well, that beauty. And we got a few uh, very bright particles or fragments or something that uh, go drifting by as we maneuver. It looks like the 4th of July out of Ron's window. No, but we've got the booster and is she pretty? Challenger's just sitting in her nest. Uh, Roger. other than uh, Captain America is very intent on getting Challenger at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming in a little slow, but uh, we've got plenty of time. Ron Evans now at the controls of America, uh, moving in for the docking with the uh, lunar module Challenger. Let's lock it together. Ready. She's uh, lined up, not bad. Okay. Uh, prime one. Mark it. Stand by. There she comes. Okay, we got it. Oh, man, did we? Capture Houston. Uh, Roger. This is Apollo Control. Uh, America and Challenger are on their own at an altitude of 13,000 nautical miles from Earth. Seventeen to us, to the crew, is probably best summed up in uh, the meaning of our patch as we uh, designed it and as the ideas that uh, we put into it. We felt certainly that Apollo 17, in spite of the fact that it's the uh, last flight in the Apollo program, is really not the end, but uh, but rather the beginning. It's sort of a culmination of what we consider man's greatest achievements, certainly in our lifetime. And uh, looking in the future, these uh, achievements and the potentials of them have uh, literally no bounds. We have the God of Apollo on our patch. Uh, he uh, represents not just the Apollo program, but mankind himself uh, represents knowledge, represents wisdom. And Apollo is looking out into the future. He's not looking behind. And he's not simply looking at the moon, someplace that uh, mankind has been. But he's looking on beyond the moon and into the future. We have, uh, along with him, up in the corner uh, of our patch, a, uh, a golden moon, sort of representing uh, a golden era of space flight uh, that we are uh, bringing to a close now. The achievements that have happened in this past decade uh, were not by accident. America brought us where we are today, and the United States of America is going to lead us into the achievements and the accomplishments of the future. This is Apollo Control. Cernan and Schmidt have gone aboard the lunar module Challenger, going through the housekeeping transfer of items from the command module into the lunar module, and we'll proceed with the checklist of activating the spacecraft communication system. Uh, Evans had the detail of removing the probe and drogue earlier, but uh, he's by his lonesome back in the command module. but under the circumstances, I guess it'll be okay. Uh, next time he's a good father, you might have him put a good word in for us. Okay, I'll do that. Hello, Houston, I've got the moon. Boy, is it big. We're coming in right down on top of it. Roger, that's uh, about right. Uh, don't worry, you'll miss it. Well, I just want to hear you say it, because I'm going to hold you to it. Hello, America. How do you read Houston? Over. Hello. Houston, this is America. You can breathe easier. America has arrived on station for the challenge ahead.
Challenger Houston, you have a go for undocking and step. Roger, understand, and go for undocking and step. Three, two, one. We got it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, looks good on board. Okay, looks good on the ground. Now, the landing site uh, of Apollo 17 Taurus Littrow is, uh, and I'm speaking uh, from, the, from the guy who's actually going to fly the spacecraft uh, to land it, is very, very challenging. It's sort of a box canyon surrounded by mountains on three sides and a uh, landslide that comes off one of the mountains that has some rubble that is strewn across some of the craters just in front of where we're going to land. So from a pilot point of view, it's very, very challenging. Gordo, this is spectacular. It is absolutely spectacular looking at that command module America down there coming across the surface. Sounds great. Hey, Ron, listen, this ridge here coming on over, just stick your hand out the hatch and grab a rock. Uh -huh. We got the landing site. We're coming right over the front of it. Super targeting. Uh, we've got the uh, family mountain. We've got, uh, of course, the machine. We can see the scarf. We can see the light mantle. I've got the Great Cross, Camelot, Sherlock. Believe it or not, Houston, they're all there. Houston, I can even see Poppy right where we're going to set this baby down. Very good. Man, Gordo, this is absolutely spectacular. Sure sounds like it. During the next frontside pass comes a moment of truth. Challenger will descend to the surface of the moon and touch down at the Taurus Litro landing site. Okay, all flight controllers gonna go for power descent. Retro? Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for power descent. Challenger Houston, you're go for PDI. We are go up here for PDI. Master arm on. Okay, Houston, master arm is on. I've got two good lights. Roger. Oh, man, are we down among us, babe? Woo! Ignition. Ignition, Houston. Attitude looks good. Roger, you're looking good here. Okay, Gordon, we're out of 11,009. And the computer likes it. Stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Oh, baby. I'll need the pro. I'll give it to you. Pitch over. Proceeded. And there it is, Houston. There's Camelot. Wow. Wide on target. I see it. We got them all. 42 degrees, 37 degrees, to 5,500. Challenger, you're going for feet. landing. Fuel is good. Here, are getting close. 500. 15 feet per second. 300 feet. Going down at 5. Going down at 5. Your fuel's good. 110 feet. Stand by for some dust. 80 feet. Getting a little dust. 40 feet going down at three. Very little dust. Very little dust. Stand by for touchdown. Feels good. 20 feet. Stand by. 10 feet. Contact. Engine stop. Engine arm. Proceed. Command override off. Boat control ahead. Hold. Pings auto. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. Roger, Challenger, that's super. Boy, you bet it is, Gordo. Boy, you said shut down, I shut down, and we dropped, didn't we? Yes, sir. But we is here. Man, is we here. How's that look? Pressures look great. Manifold's right on. Brian, I had the meatball all the way. Beautiful. Jack, are we going to have some nice boulders in this area? Okay, the old camera's off. Okay. Challenger Houston, I'm going to hand you over to the good Dr. Parker here. Have a good trip outside there. Gordy, thank you. You do outstanding work, and uh, we sure do appreciate it, babe. My pleasure. I think we're getting to our favorite part here. <laughs> click, click, click. Your helmet is locked. Your visor is locked. Oh, man. Woo! You ready for this? I hope so.
commander is on the porch. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm on the uh, footpad. And Houston, as I step off at the surface at Torres Littrow, we'd like to dedicate the first steps of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. Oh my golly! Unbelievable! Unbelievable, but is it bright in the sun? How you doing, Jack? Fine. Jack, you're looking good. Beautiful, guys, beautiful. Hatch is closed. Hey, Jack, don't lock it. I'm not gonna lock it. We gotta, we gotta go back there. You lose the key and we're in trouble. Well, I tell you, Gene, I think the uh, next generation ought to accept this as a challenge, to see them lead footsteps like these someday. A geologist's paradise, if I ever saw one. I never thought I'd do geology this way. Taurus littoral site on the northeastern part of the moon at the edge of one of the large lunar basins called Serenitatis was selected as representing both a new part of the moon, which we had not explored yet, and having major features that would allow us to complete this first phase of lunar exploration. In last chapters of a lunar history book that Apollo has the capability of writing. Those features are the edge of the Serenitatis Basin, where we have a very strong possibility of finding some of the oldest, if not the oldest, rocks that uh, have so far been sampled and observed on the moon. And it also has the dark mantling deposit that is potentially some of the youngest volcanic rocks that we've seen on the moon. And then, of course, there's this other thing of the unexpected, and who knows what that's going to be. And that's really what makes it exciting. Deploy an LSEP. Have at it. 
First, I gotta find an ALSEP site. Schmidt carrying the ALSEP uh, about 100 meters east of the uh, LAM. Gene Cernan will drive out to the ALSEP site in the rover. Site selection in all the missions entails the utilization by NASA of a number of scientific advisory groups and the inputs of many individuals across the country, scientists primarily. From the scientific point of view, uh, in terms of the instruments that we're going to place on the surface, the landing site was picked because it gives us a tremendous network of scientific instrumentation that is still active from all the previous Apollo missions spread across the face of the moon. We can see activity of earthquakes and uh, meteor impacts and it gives us a pretty good cross-section to pinpoint where this activity is and exactly what's happening. How's the TV working? Beautiful. To coin a phrase, it's a panoramic scene of beauty. Hey, Bob, what do you think of the terrain? Looks flat. Looks very flat and smooth. That's why you're an astronomer. <laughs> oh, well. In the moon, we have a window into the very early history of a planet in the near-Earth part of the solar system. From 3.3 billion years ago, back to, say, 4.6 billion years ago. That is a history which is almost totally obscured to us on Earth. On the moon, that's where lunar history starts, and that's why it's exciting to Earth scientists who have for years been trying to find out what happened to the Earth in that very early time, and an understanding of the processes that really affected the total distribution of materials on the Earth. And it's in those materials that lie our resources, and in the long term, uh, understanding of the Earth so that we can exploit those resources and exploit them in obviously a, a now I think a much more enlightened way than maybe we did in the past but nevertheless we must exploit them in order to preserve the civilization we're used to. That's reason number one, a little bit involved but it is probably the primary material justification, scientific justification of going to them. Secondly, and equally important related to the Earth is an understanding of the history of the Sun and within the soils of the Moon and within the uh, rocks of the Moon very surface layers of the moon, we are starting to see the effects of solar history on those materials. And there is no way we could get this information on the Earth or in orbit around the Earth because what we see there is what's happening now. What we see on the moon, we can go through the record of the soil and see what has happened a hundred million years ago and up to probably at least a billion years ago in some places on the moon. And if we don't understand the sun and how it affects materials and what the history of that sun has been as it has affected our own environment on earth it's going to be very difficult to understand how to preserve the environment that we now know because the sun is still the prime mover the prime force for change in the environment we have to deal with
from now, but remember, they left this side a little bit late. Okay, we copy that. And 17, a reminder to factor do you think, and this is only a 30-minute stop, and it's about two zero minutes remaining. Yes, sir. But well, we got a sample, huh? Okay. See if we can't fill this up for Christmas. You happy there? Yeah, that's good. Get your after. I'll get my after picture here. I'm going to take a, uh, a close-up stereo on that yeah. contact. Definitely. So what I really bring as a specialty is the ability, hopefully, of being able to integrate what I see, which in turn not only tells me what I should sample or what I should say or what I should photograph about what I see, 
but it will lead me to other observations. And this is something you gain by experience, no matter what field you're in. Field geology, aircraft flying, test piloting, uh, botany, poetry, law, you name it. What you gain by experience is the rapid synthesis of what you're exposed to and a projection of that exposure into the next step. And so uh, I don't feel myself very unusual being a scientist because we've had specialists before. And I'm really a geologist going to the moon and we've got other types of scientists going on the Skylab program. Physicists, solar physicists, and medical doctor. We're just gradually evolving a phase of the exploration of space where uh, we're now trying to apply specialties to the particular problems we have to deal with. I was strolling on the moon one day in a very, very month of December. Now, May, May, May is the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. When they're much to my surprise, a pair of lonely eyes. Do -do 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 -do. Da -da 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 Almost looks like it's getting dark out, isn't it? <laughs> Hope not. Or oh, we are in trouble. I'd like you to know you had a seven hour and 12 minute EVA. I think it's a tremendous job for what we might call a challenging EVA. Bob, that's no pun. It really was. It really was. I know it, man. I know it. I tell you, I really wish you guys could have been here with us. You worked as hard at it as we did, if not harder. Harder, I think. This is Apollo Control at 124 hours, 23 minutes. And board uh, challenger on the letter service. Jack Schmidt and uh, Gene Cernan are in the process of uh, getting the uh, lunar module uh, reconfigured, uh, ready for their sleep period, which the flight plan uh, calls for them to begin at about three and a half hours from now. Houston, uh, we've been working while you've been sleeping on a fix for the missing fender. Uh, John Young's been over uh, working it out in a suit with the mock-up rover. Sounds good, babe. Appreciate it. Okay, I'll now turn the microphone over to Captain Young. Hey, uh, Gino, this is John. Hello, John. How are you doing? Oh, just fine. You guys are doing a superb job. Really beautiful. Hey, we spent some time on this uh, fender problem 
and uh, worked out a pretty uh, simple-minded procedure, which involves essentially taking uh, four of those lunar surface maps, taping them together with gray tape so that you end up a, with a piece of paper about uh, 15 inches uh, by 10 and a half inches and clamping uh, the edges of it on top of the fender uh, with the AOT lamp clamps. It's uh, simple and straightforward, and the beauty of it is you're only uh, spending about two minutes in the clamping operation, and it could save you up to about 12, Dustin, I think, maybe. What do you think? Hey, thank you, Dave. Uh, we're going to work on it right now. Okay, hold it right there. Let me get the, uh, okay. I think that'll stop the dust, that way. Well, it'll stop some of it if it stays on. Crew is using maps to make that fender. The clamps are from the uh, optical alignment telescope lamp. As you can see, it's only a paper fender, but the moon is real. Hold it right there while I clamp it down. Man, it's tight. I think that'll stay. I think it'll stay. Okay, it's uh, are configured. Sounds like a good attempt, man. We'll hope it works. Does that look good to John, from what he did? It looks exactly what he did, he says. We got to take a picture of that fender if it works. Hey, man. Gene, you're good as is. We're ready for you guys to go. OK, we are moving right now. OK, we're marking that. The crew has started for station two, the most distant of the stations more than seven kilometers away. It's a little rocky out here. Yeah, it sure is. Okay, the fender fix is working so far. Then I'm uh, averaging probably 10 to 11 clicks. It's uh, I'm not exactly straight line navigation, but I think I can hold most of it. Uh, Roger, beautiful. The Taurus Littrow site for Apollo 17 is one where, at the mountain front, you'll be hearing the name South Massif and North Massif as we explore that part of the moon. At these fronts, or massifs, there is an excellent probability, because of the impact event that formed the Serenitatis Basin, we will see rocks that form the early lunar crust. The big emphasis there will be to see these very old rocks that will help push this history book of the moon back right up to the very earliest possible time that we can examine on the moon that we know about, potentially as old as 4.4 or 5 million years old. Hold it, Jack. Oh, watch it. Hold it. Hold it. You can go around that one. <laughs> you, you betcha. <laughs> Woo! Get and wrinkle your toes now. Oh, I wouldn't worry, Gene. Okay, the surface is not changing. In terms of the detail, the uh, surface texture of the fine-grained uh, regolith, uh, most of the uh, brightest craters have a little central pit in the bottom, uh, which is glass lined. Look at that Roger. crater. Woo. Oh, man, it shivets. Woo. Boy, I tell you, are those massifs getting to look big now? Holy, holy. Man, this has been a trip. Man, I tell you, you know, we're really up on top of this thing. You guys have been driving 64 minutes. Well, we're almost ready to park. Okay, beautiful. We're right where we wanted to be for Station 2, and it looks like a great place. They park. Station 2 is right at the base of the South Massif. Bob, I want to get this camera fixed. Okay. Any other service I can be? Can I change your oil? Uh, thank you, Gene. That would look much better. Man, that's the way to come downhill. <laughs> Just don't stub your toe. Man, there's some boulder rolling rocks here, Jack. <laughs> hey, uh, Gene. Yeah. Set up right there. Let's get oh. that. Let's get that big class. Oh, the class. Yes, yeah. sir. Good eye. Good eye. Big white class. Good in the, eye. Uh, gray matrix pressure. Good eye. Man, that's a pride. Bob, you still there? Roger, still there, listening with great flight. Got a bag, got a bag. The soil from right underneath the rock. Okay, we're going to have to get a little closer. Okay, 
the old boulder rolling trick. Don't hit the rover. 17, if you want to just take a minute, you might look up in the sky and notice beautiful Mother Earth.